everybody, and welcome to this episode of Heretic Hammer. I am your host, Marshall, and I'm here with my co-host, Dylan. Hello, everybody. And today, we're flipping the script. We were loyal. Now it's time to be bad. <laughs> we're talking about Chaos Space Marines today. Though, I should correctly say, Chaos and Traitor Space Marines. As we'll get into, not all are explicitly followings to every aspect of chaos. So let's begin, shall we? Do any of these ones punch things? I mean, in a way, yeah. But like, it's not anybody's explicit shtick. Okay. There, there's no, there's no chaos legions that are like we are the legion of strong fingers, and we actually punch things. Yes, but I will. We'll definitely get into the legion that probably punches the most. Excellent. That's what I'm here for. Exactly. All right. So first up, we get to move to the third legion of uh, the third legion of Space Marines, and that is the Emperor's Children, led by Fulgrim. I feel like they'd be biased towards favoritism if they're if they get to walk around being called the Emperor's Children. You know what? And there's some truth to that. So, very, as you can tell by this image, very artsy, very, you know, like, lavish looking. It's, it's um, giving King George, for sure. Exactly, yeah. I mean, their ships were like a purple, pink, and gold. They utilized a bunch of art in, and dueling was a big focus inside of the Emperor's Children. <clears throat> However, unfortunately, as will happen, we'll talk about in all of these stories. Uh, How did it all Fulgrim go wrong? Fell, yeah, Fulgrim fell to chaos. Specifically, not necessarily to his own choice. Uh, he unfortunately came into contact with a demonic blade of Slanesh, the Prince of Pleasure, the goddess of unspeakable excess. See, the thing is, the Emperor's children really <laughs> seeked perfection they wanted to be the best at what they did right mm -hmm. that's what drove them to be so good at what they were doing and now in fort and that honest that unfortunately led them right into what Solnesh is, is geared towards and so uh unfortunately due to this foul blade that uh this demonic blade that was uh carried by uh fulgrim he went from being the sexy man that you know to the sexy snake that he oh, is now. Oh, no. Downgrade. Uh, Full-on demonic Primarch. He is just a... He is, he is the demon, prim, demon prince Primarch of Slanesh. And, you know, he hasn't been in the setting for a while. The model that I am showing Dylan that will be on the screen for the video viewers is actually just his newest model that was introduced for 30K. However, the fun thing about that is while the Empress children don't have their own supplemental army in the game, the tabletop game yet, everyone is expecting them to during 10th edition here. So only a matter of time, but at the recording, not, at, not there yet, but should be. Uh, okay. Should be within, or at least a couple years, within a couple years. Um, but yes, he the Emperor's Legion are explicitly a legion loyal to Slanesh. But as we were getting to earlier, yes, they were a legion that was very much about like duelists. They had nice, like large columns. They were, they were just about trying to be the best that they can. And they were honestly very camaraderie but then yeah unfortunately one specific event happened so they had a concert inevitably denoted as the Mara Vigilia, Mara Viglia sorry <laughs> the Mara Viglia and this was from a revance for uh, a, a remembrance or sorry uh, named Bekwa Kinska uh, she had essentially when they had when they had gone into they had essentially stepped into this uh Ruin that was corrupted by Slanesh. It's where he found the blade, right? Um, she also was everybody that was there was affected by that, and she heard this song. It was incomprehensible with human instruments, as far as she knew. And her concert was essentially to anybody who wasn't already falling to Slanesh at this time mm -hmm. was just pure horrific noise. 
it just was ungodly, horrid noise. <laughs> but Fulgrim and many of the other space rings that were falling to Slanesh at this time heard it as this beautiful music that she had also heard it as. And they all went fucking berserk. And now there are these depraved, strange chaos marines. Just they they have a special type of unit in them uh, that were taken essentially utilized weapons, but they were originally the instruments of this concert called noise marines, uh, and they use this essentially sonic blast to impair and kill their enemies. Um, huh. Others utilize, you know, they will. They will just be hyper into, you know, enhancing drug, like crazy enhancing drugs. Um, one of their notable characters is named uh, Fabius Bile, who essentially believed that he could make the Legion better by just doing these various experiments and is still roaming around to this day. Um, and they have a special unit called the Noise Marine, as I mentioned, which is uses the sonic weaponry to just a greater extent. Uh, what's funny, though, about the Noise Marines and what I love about them, though, is they have traditionally kind of continually been stylized many times into this, like, metal rocker vibe. Like, they actually have their old models, and they came out with a commemorative one semi-recently, where it just looks like this 80s hair metal style Marine. Um, the art I'm showing Dylan right now is actually from the magic card that came out in the commander set. Oh, interesting. Uh, and I love that aspect and I want it to be canon so bad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I want it to be real. They should be. And I really hope that when they do come out with the full army, that that will be the case. Uh, but yeah, they are bad people. They're fucked up. They're super fucked up. They do terrible things to to terrible things to people all in the sense of pain, pleasure, and the suit of perfection. But yeah, there's a lot more lore to it, but that's kind of the basic rundown of what you need to know about them. They're, they're very tragic, but that's kind of what makes them interesting, you know? Next, my favorite CSM Legion, the fourth Legion, the Iron Warriors. The Iron Okay, so we have the Iron Hand on one side, and then now we've got mm-hmm. the Iron Warriors here on the other. Yes, and these this is the army that is most likely to punch you with a power fist. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah, so they remember. How, so remember how I talked about how Rogaldorn can kind of look at a bunch of scrap, and you can see how I can turn this into a bridge or I can turn this into a building, right? The Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Perturabo, is the direct opposite. He can see anything and know how to deconstruct it. And therefore, it makes him really good at building things because he can he knows what it was and then what the parts became, right? And then you can just reverse engineer it. Um, but the Emperor, unfortunately, saw that part for what it is, destruction, and made him the Imperial Siege Master. Um, yeah. So they would siege and they could conquer worlds with this brutal efficiency. And the funniest thing about Perturabo is Bricky has a great, has had a great notion for him. He is so bitter that coffee beans run for light. Huh. <laughs> he... Because he essentially was always put into this position where he can never in- showcase what he felt like his strengths were. He always was forgotten by his brothers, taken advantage of by his brothers, or at least felt so. And the main reason he turned traitor was just because he felt so pissed off at everyone else that had remained loyal. That And he felt like Horace was giving him the proper chance. Oh, okay. And he was, until he wasn't. Yeah. But... While he's very harsh, right? He is very hard on his legion. He, during the heresy, for example, like if you weren't efficient enough and like didn't succeed in your job, you essentially had to go through a lottery and one of those dudes would just be killed because of your failure, right? He's not like nice, right? But he's, he is, that was like he, that eventually did also kind of go away. But like that was the thing, right? Like his whole thing was just about, being efficient so he could showcase his ability to his father to the emperor and get the credit that he deserved but never got um 
he now unfortunately though is a demon primarch uh he which is a sore spot for kind of myself and a number of other iron warriors fans um the reason being is the iron warriors traditionally don't use chaos they are traitors yeah but honestly the thing about perturabo is his whole thing is kind of like he just kind of feels like he could run the imperium better than at this point better than the emperor did and that anyone else he felt like he should have been the war master right that horse became uh-huh but he wasn't um so why he became a demon primarch we don't know um he hasn't been seen in real space in a long time he has been known to have helped the black crusades but he's not showed up um so this is more like theorized art of him but like we don't know why he became a demon primarch. A lot of people, the theory that's out there that I, the only main one that I wish to subscribe to kind of is that he kind of did it from this aspect of like either to help his legion or just be or essentially just cause it's like, he has to kind of do it or something bad would happen or just to essentially abuse them. Cause they have been known at least in lore or at least as sections of the iron warriors um, have been known to, abuse demons and their link to their small link to chaos because they were in the eye of terror um in order to make them into machinery <laughs> like if you look at models and stuff you will find things called forge fiends and those are literally just demons inside of machines <laughs> oh, okay like they will summon them and trap them and use them as cannon fodder <laughs> hmm. uh and that I'm okay with, right? The idea of abusing chaos for your own gain, but not being super chaos rabbit hold. Uh, some members of the Iron Wars kind of have. Uh, you can look up the Demonculaba in your own leisure uh, if you wish to have that type of weird nightmarish thing. And that is technically a canon thing, uh, but it's kind of like one of those... It's Demonculaba is kind of one of those things you like tell somebody be like go look up the Demonculaba. <laughs> um, but to, one of my favorite things of art, and I will have this on the screen now to really implicate where the Iron Warriors are now, is this image. Um, <laughs> and I love this image because what it is just. At? It is a gun that has, like, three other guns. It has a weird magazine at the front. It has a bunch of chain bayonets onto it. And <laughs> it's just, like, this is from a codex, right? Like, this is from official GW material. It is, and it has, not only has the magazine, it has a magazine, but then also has a bandolier on it, right? Like a chain gun would have. <laughs> like. It's so much. It's there is like, so much going on. It's like Cloud's Buster Sword in Advent Children, where it's made <laughs> up of like eight smaller swords that all yeah, fit right? in with each other somehow. And It's so funny. I love it so much. It's one of my favorite ways to like just showcase the interestingness of the Iron Warriors. What, what does it look like when you fire that? Like, is it just like a single? I don't know. Blast? I it just could like destroy not tell itself you. in the process. <laughs> right? I don't know. But that's the thing, right? It's the Iron Warriors, so it would work. That's the crazy part. Well, it's guaranteed to is work. This would work. Yeah, because they're good. They're so good at doing at building this stuff. We're giving them a free pass. That's that's my thought. I think we're giving them a free pass. I think yeah, we need exactly. To, we need to hold Absolutely. them accountable. <laughs> no, they need to keep the free pass because that's what makes them good. <laughs> that's what makes them great. <laughs> they keep the free pass. They get a free pass. They are given it. <laughs> uh, but you know who wasn't given a free pass? Uh, that would be Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords oh, of the Seventh Legion. Conrad Kurz, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, um, if you wanted a salty emo, like kind of like Russian man aesthetic, that's Conrad Kurz for you. Um, they are. Uh, so here's the thing about Conrad. So he was he was brought up on on a death world. So it was just like this, just our hive city. Sorry, specifically a hive city, but one of just like 
it was like if you made an entire planet the night of Gotham City, right? And so he wanted to be the Batman of this Gotham, right? As so you he do. did it in Yeah, so his whole thing is fear, right? He order through fear, right? If you here's a great example actually, so of his philosophy. So if the Dark Angels, the Space Wolves, even the Ultramarines, right, they conquered a planet, they would just destroy the armies existing. Some of them, like Lionel Johnson or like the Dark Angels, just completely almost lambast it, like just bomb it to shit, right? Mm -hmm. Kill hundreds of millions of people and then bring it into compliance, right? Conrad, he brought his own planet and other planets into compliance by just killing mysteriously and the, or displaying the deaths of very high-ranking people in order to fill compliance. So it was funny because he would be borderline, you know, he was borderline just as efficient at conquering worlds as his brothers, but he would kill significantly less people, right? His belief was not to kill a mass of people, but instead just kill and f instill fear in the mass by killing small amounts of people. Oh. It's not to say that he wasn't fucked up, but it's like it's a thought, right? It's a yeah, it's an interesting yeah, philosophy. Sure. Like so, it's he's dead. Great, uh, <laughs> which is good. Yes, because he's a sick fuck. Yep. Um, but the iron the night lords now unfortunately have very much corrupted themselves in a different way over time. Right? Uh, they are is just terrible people. Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> are filled with gangers. You know, like just gangers, murderers, people who commit the R word that rhymes with grape. <laughs> um, they will find people who have committed murders and atrocities as young as 12 years old and recruit them to become night lords. Jeez. Right. Um, and this honestly is generally be after this. This started, though, after Conrad died. Right. He wouldn't have actually approved of that. He actually hated criminals. So it was very interesting. While he was fucked up, he felt it was that realm of like I can like I will be fucked up in order to be the thing that people fear so they they, they don't become me, right? Yeah. Um and so yeah, so he eventually was killed. Uh he was captured and killed. Um I believe he was I know he was captured by the dark angels. I can't remember if they are explicitly the ones that killed him. No, he escaped. Um he escaped the Dark Angels during their fight, their civil war, um, and then was eventually killed by an assassin when he was just hiding out somewhere. Um, and he kind of let himself be killed because he and Sanguinius both had the power, actually, of precognition. Um, and each of them saw their own deaths coming. However, Sanguinius had believed that he could change the future. So when he would see a future, he would try to avoid it. Okay. Okay. Conrad believed that if you see the future, it must happen. He has to do everything he can to ensure it happens. So when he saw his death, he knew it was coming and was happy with it. Well, good for Conrad. And yeah, the Night Lords now are just super fucked up. <laughs> uh, great example. They will find a world. They'll, they'll like take over a ship and like, and then they'll like escape and People will be like, oh, my God, we, we drove them off. And then they will just take, like, the flayed and skinned individuals and just rain it on the planet, on the populace. Wow. Fear. Fear is their is the name of their game. But you know what else can be scary? Sharks. No. Oh. A really angry man running for you. <laughs> 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 With two chain axes revving it up. All right, so now we're on the anger-colored legion. That's right, and that is the <laughs> world eaters. Really obvious what they are. They're led by Angron, right? Oh, like, come on. Yeah. No, like, I won't allow yeah. it. <laughs> Do you guess what Angron's thing is? Apathy. <laughs> yeah, I know. So here's actually a thing about that. He, While his name is his name, right, he was, when he was... When he went to his planet, he actually got enslaved as a gladiator. Um, and he, when he refused to kill essentially his best friend in the in the ring when he was being demanded to, uh, they put this spike in his brain. 
that essentially made it so that if he didn't feel rage, anger, just bitterment, it would cause him physical pain, unending physical pain. Okay. And inevitably, he drove his Space Marine Legion to this because he felt very embittered by the way that the Emperor brought him into the fold. Because they had, on his home world, they had gone through a revolt. And so he and the other gladiators were had escaped, revolted, and left. Uh, however, they were going to be chased down and were fighting against the official, you know, planet. Like, the officials of the planet. Um, and so the emperor came down and was like, Hey, I need you to come with me. I can't let you die here. And he was like, no, I need to stay with my brethren. I need to stay with my, you know, these other gladiators that I have fought and di- and like bled with. And he was like, all right, I'll give you this chance. And he left. And <laughs> then just essentially in the last stand, they were all going to lose. Right. And in that last stand, the emperor just yoinked Angron out there and all of his friends died. They didn't win. And he felt very bitter about it. And he ne- really looked down on the Emperor because of it. So it was not hard for him to become a traitor. It was not hard for him to fall to chaos mm-hmm. because Corn loves an angry murder man. And thus he is the demon primarch of Corn that, that uh, we can see here if you're watching this on YouTube. Um. And so what's actually interesting is the world eaters were, they were kind of different before. Like, they were always obviously like these brutal, like berserk barbarians, right? But they had a completely different color scheme. They were white and blue. You know, they, and a lot of them honestly didn't want to have, because they inevitably, Angron pushed for all of these, they're called the butcher's nails, to be put in the brains of all world eaters members. Um, and many of them didn't want that. They they felt like Angron, they actually felt like Angron wasn't treating them fairly. So there was kind of a mini civil war during this time. Uh, it was very mini in that it wasn't a whole lot of them. Like it wasn't like the size of the Dark Angels. Mm-hmm. Uh, but inevitably, the rage filled in like essentially power embattled because those who put had, essentially that's the thing, right? Those who had the butcher's nails in them had no reserves right and that's what angron wanted he wanted his legion to fight without the reservation of fear of potentially wanting to help somebody he just wanted them to just kill and have no qualms about it and so yeah so they fell pretty hard uh into the world of chaos this image i am currently showing dylan is the codex cover for the world eaters and it's a lot isn't it? Yep, sure is a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> looks like they're you know very, very quietly enjoying just like a nice nice tea party together. You know, like letting the letting the animals play around in the backyard and you know just just a nice relaxing evening. I love the dude uh, that you can like see partly his bicep and like how there's just six hundred oh, muscles it's in yoked. it. It's it's um, disgustingly large. Yeah, I mean they're all melee. They are explicit. They are pretty much all melee. Like it's you're hard to far pressed to find a gun in this, right? Yeah. Very, very much and, trying uh, to find Waldo. Yeah. The, uh, and yeah, that's what they are. That's as simple as that. And uh, however, we're gonna get a little stinky. Is next up, it's the Death Guard, stinky. led by Mortarian. Uh, so they come from the world of Barbarous Mortarian. Also an incredibly bitter dude. Um, but the big thing his comes from his world, Barbarus was like plagued by psychic beings and like especially like the Drukari and stuff like that. They were just plagued by this. And so, you know, when he built his legion, he built it to be defensive. He wanted them to just be nigh unkillable, right? Yeah. Like a normal marine could get you know, like they they'll flick off something because they got like shot and they got hit in the armor or whatever. Uh, a Death Guard person would get stabbed and just keep going, <laughs> or like they would get shot in the gut, perforate the armor, shoot back, mm-hmm. just nigh unkillable. And this unfortunately led them. Not too much to say about Mortarian other than that, like he just hated psychers, right? Which was funny because then he eventually got became the champion of Nurgle. 
Uh, so he became a psychic chaos demon of pestilence, um, which was a bit of an identity crisis for him for a while. But the Death Guard themselves, uh, because of the stupid of because of the stupid actions of of his former like first lieutenant Typhus, uh, now the whole Legion is besieged or is kind of are are given the gifts of Father Nurgle. Mm. And they are now the Plague and Blight Marines, and they are a fester on the galaxy. Lovely. Uh, they, yeah, I mean, they had, they were like, they used to just be very staunch defenders, and now are just these bloated, mutated, gross Marines. <laughs> you know, they come near you, it's hard to resist like if you're a normal human and you're nearby a plague marine you're just immediately shooting shit out of out of both ends you're things are coming out of both ends like it's not a good time awful i, I don't know gross. what else to say that's yeah. that's just terrible yeah. yeah but a lot of people i don't know a lot of the reason that people this is a good time because we're we're about to go into our last chaos specific faction right so, like, we've had Slanesh, we've had Korn, Nurgle, mm-hmm. next will be Zinj. Um, you may be wondering, why on earth would anybody want any of this? Right? Well, outside of being and, insane. Well, and this is the thing, right? Um, there's two sides to the Chaos coin. Remember, we talked about this a little bit in the first episode. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody may see Korn as just slaughter, but he's very honorable, right? He will not betray you. Um, Slanesh, while a lot of pleasure and excess, still pleasure, right? Things that feel good. A lot of pride, right? Like the ability to feel good about what you do. Nurgle, right? The idea of that, yes, pestilence and death and decay, but the the aspect of, of, of a choice, like of a definite choice that like what you, the world is as it is. And no matter what, we are all the same. Nurgle is kind of known, honestly. People get attracted to Nurgle, not just because of the Nurglings, which are adorable. Nurgle is all accepting, right? His mutations are looked at as gifts. And while they seem disgusting to us, by the time that you, when you are blessed with, when you are given Nurgle's blessing, it doesn't seem that way, right? It's a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the big thing, right? Like whenever you fall to chaos, when you're dealing with these chaos things, you, your mind shifts. You don't look at this stuff as horrid things right because when you accept it they're no longer horrid they are instead release they are freedom right you look at the imperium right you can't say you want you want you can't do what you want you are working in a factory for 18 hours a day but you you get accepted by an argle and all of a sudden you're you're free to do what you want you can you know, you just know, and you know, you may die, but that is the way it is. And that is, that is the end that you can look forward to. So that's kind of the thing to remember with chaos, right? As we go through these. Uh, and sometimes when you follow chaos, you start to follow it just because you're a nerd who fucked up. And that would be Magnus <laughs> of the thousand sons. Okay, but how So bad? I alluded to this. How bad did he, he fucked up? Really, real bad. That that bad. So he was obviously he when he was sent through the warp, much like Sanguinius, he also got affected by it and was given you know was given his own little bit of mutations as well, right? He had his red skin. Mm-hmm. He is he is red, like the red you see him in his demonic form. That is what he was before that, right? Okay. He was always red skinned. He's Magnus the Red, and. The thing about that, and he's a very powerful psyker. He's one of the only Primarchs that was in communication with the Emperor before that he was found by the Emperor. Um, so when the Emperor showed up, they like talked like they knew each other for years. Mm-hmm. He was welcomed in, right? When the Emperor arrived to Prospero. But yeah, so Magnus fucked up. So what happened was... Um, he found out that Horus was going to betray the Imperium, 
right? And despite having his psychic powers supposed to be banned, despite kind of getting a little bit perturbed by people like Lehman Russ and Mortarian, um, he was still very loyal, right? And so he had re he had decided, all right, what I'm going to do, I need to go warn the emperor. Got to the got to, he psychically projected himself to Terra. Terra had a big the or the throne room had this big barrier around it, uh -huh. and this voice showed up and was like, "Hey, I'll help you break this barrier so that you can go tell him." And he was just so um. desperate and not thinking clearly. He said, "All right." And so he blasted through the barrier. Sir. And instead what he did is he opened a giant fucking warp portal in the Webway project so that Im the Imperium of Man wouldn't have to rely on warp travel anymore. They can instead have their own set of tunnels, much like the Webway, but their own, to safely travel through the stars. And it instead got then blasted by demons, and the imp Emperor had to sit on the golden throne in order to keep them at bay at all times lest Terra be completely besieged by demons. Yeah. And that voice was Zinch, tricking Magnus <laughs> into doing that. Um and thus we get to then the emperor sends Lehman Russ to go arrest Magnus. Horus intercepts this as the war master having betrayed the emperor at this point, uh, but secretly tells Lehman Russ to go kill him. Lehman Russ destroys Prospero, gives Magnus the fucking Bane backbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, it, an epiphany comes across because Magnus originally had sequestered to just let himself be punished, right? He felt so bad. Yeah. Right? This is why people will say that Magnus did nothing wrong because he tried to help. He fucked up, but he tried to help. Uh, but he did do wrong because he did fuck up and he should have known better. Um, but nevertheless, like they, they were all destroyed, but enough about Magnus himself because he inevitably, yes, then realized he did not want his legion to die and succumb them all to the, to make a deal with Zinch. And they all whisked away into a new world in the warp and are now a legion of sorcerers. And, but they always were a legion of sorcerers is partly the thing, right? Like they were very heavily with psychers. If you liked magic, honestly, you'll love this. If you love like magic and being a wizard and stuff like that, you'll love the thousand suns then and now, um, you know, they, they had their normal Marines, but they used a lot of psychic powers because that's what Magnus and Prospero was all about. They knew how to use magic safely without immediately being corrupted. But they had an issue is that they were having this weird, the thousand sons were having this weird mutation happen to them called the flesh change. And it would turn them into these monstrous demonic like beings. And so, so unfortunately a chaos sorcerer, well liked by uh, Magnus named uh, Araman thought he found a solution in this book, the, in the book of Magnus. And unfortunately he had turned all non psychic Marines of the Thousand Suns into dust and their armor sealed up and the dust within them, turning them into mindless soldiers to only be controlled by their sorcerers. And so now Araman and many other sorcerers are continually trying to find ways to revert that curse, bring their brothers back. There's actually a great note in the story of and it's a it's an Adeptus Sororitas Sisters of Battle novel called Bark of Faith and they fight a sorcerer a thousand sun sorcerer at the end and his whole thing is he want he's doing what he's doing while inherently kind of you know bad and evil and you know killing other dudes and whatnot mm -hmm. he's doing it because he looks at his two they're just dust encased guards next to him but they were his best friends and he wants them back so that's kind of what helps the like, the the connectiveness of the Thousand Sons, right? There's a there's a tragedy that you can attach to, and then if you like wizards, that also helps. And like the Zinch stuff always looks pretty cool. It's like this like crazy like mindfuck macabre shit with like a bunch of eyes and teeth and stuff. So they're still and trying cool. to find the 
a way to revert that curse to this day. They still haven't figured that out. Yep. It is Armin's sole purpose. Okay. To redeem himself to Magnus and the rest of the Legion by finding a solution. However, we have to go to the big betrayer himself next, and that is Horus and his Luna Wolves, Sons of Horus, and Black Legion. Yeah. So this is a great image because it really indicates the various positions where Horus is at, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. There's Silver Armored Horus, where he and the Luna Wolves, you know, he was the first found Primarch, quote-unquote. And the Emperor's favorite. He felt that he did the most. He was well liked. He was well respected by everyone, right? While everyone felt like they probably had their own reasons to become the war master, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody quest- nobody sat there and was like horse makes zero sense, right? He was well respected. However, that that's what made him a good target for chaos corruption, especially specifically by Lorgar and yeah, the dickhead Erebus. <laughs> That asshole. But yes, uh, they became... So they went from the Luna Wolves, and then the Emperor, in order to kind of instill a sense of, you know, kind of like you being the flagship guy, you're the main guy, want you to rename your legion the Sons of Horus. Right? It will just give a good motif to everything. Right? And so he does this. He didn't like it, but he does it. Uh, Because he's not really that, like full of himself to do that. So not a big, he wasn't a huge fan of it, but did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, you know, gets this in blackened armor. Once he is just like fully engorged and dives into being chaos corrupted. Yeah. Right. Just full on chaos corruption. He believes that he can be more powerful than the four gods at this point. Right. This is when he starts utilizing the famous phrase of the Black Legion, let the galaxy burn. Except his scenario was that if he couldn't save the Imperium from the Emperor, or save humanity from the Emperor, then the galaxy should burn. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, the you know, inevitably, they go from being these kind of gray armored space marines to the green kind of Sons of Horus space marines that you'll see mostly if you look up Sons of Horus or the Horus Heresy like tabletop game stuff you will see them there to being the Black Legion after Horus's death Um, named the Black Legion from the new leader of the of of the Black Legion uh, Abaddon the Despoiler Um, the thing about the Black Legion is they're not really as much of the numbered legion that they were anymore Right, like they were the 16th Legion, but now really they're just an open an open group of Chaos Space Marines. Right, if you anybody can become part of the Black Legion, you know you can do whatever. Just you don't you want to fight against the Emperor and you're a Space Marine? Come on down, <laughs> you know. It's they're very open, and therefore that's what makes them the most numerous. Right. And that's why they're the ones that are generally around a lot of shit. Um, but yeah, without Horus, uh, they are led by Abaddon, who very much kind of takes his place in a very much a similar way. So this legion is like I'm trying to think like if there was if there was an incident where they were able to overcome the other loyalist re- legions. Like, this is the Legion that would, like, quote-unquote be... That would, like, rule. I- I'm trying to think of, like, among the among the Chaos Legions, like, would they all swear fealty to uh, the, the Sons of Horus and that? Like, would they... Yeah, so they would... So, essentially, like, the thing would be, if the Black Legion were to succeed, you know, obviously the ruler of this mankind st- and whatnot would be Abaddon. Yeah. Um and the Black Legion itself. Now, that's the thing, right? There's plenty of infighting that happens between the, the traitor legions at this point. Um, you know, the Iron Hands is definitely a thing. Or not the Iron Hands, sorry. The Iron Warriors is definitely a thing where 
there's definitely going to be a point where Perturabo is going to want to try to take over what Abaddon is doing. I think he's just being very tactical at the moment. So hard to say. Mm-hmm. But for now, it's just the Black Legion wants to see the galaxy burn. Gotcha. And next up, we are getting near the end here. Uh, we've got the Word Bears headed by Lorgar, the dude who's oh, effectively Lorgar. let all this shit happen oh that low Lorgar. yep so his big thing was that he had always he grew up in a world where the they had this very distinct religious belief right they didn't know it but they were all worshiping the chaos gods mm. they just didn't know it they just noted it as the old faith Eventually, this gets to a point because the word bearers are taking so long to conquer planets and are, and he learns that they're try, like indoctrinating everybody into this religion to worship him, that he gives them a warning first to stop it. When they don't, he burns their holy city, Yeah, uh, which pisses him off. And so Erebus, the guy who had pretty much fallen to chaos well before even he found Lorgar... Um, teaches him about chaos and gets him to join it and real and Lorgar goes into this because he's like yeah like because he believed he had always believed that faith was the answer and to his defense it works because you know what they're now qu- crazy powerful and he got to do everything he wanted which was attempt to break the Imperium and bring a bunch of chaos to the realm and he got that <laughs> so he's a demon primarch now except he is like sequestered himself away in his library so he's alive but he's just like hiding out uh so yeah the word bears had kind of a distinct set shift of like armors to them they are pretty varied um they would always have all these like inscriptions on their armor they used to just be all gray and silver. Um, very, you know, they actually look a lot like Space Marines do now, which is the funny part. Yeah. Um, with, like, all the tattered words and stuff like that. And, in fact, the, like, religious text that the Imperium, like, the Imperial Church uses was written by Lorgar. They are literally the, like, the religion of the Imperium is using a book <laughs> written by Lorgar... They just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. So now they they use this kind of blood red armor and essentially just conquer planets just to, in the name of chaos at this point. They're very much kind of a jack of all trades thing, but just very religious. Use a lot of sorcery. Use a lot of demons. Will bring demons into themselves. Welcome, Lee. And that's the word bearers. The cause of all the problems. <laughs> I don't, that's interesting. The whole thing of like the willingness to bring demons in on this despite having this very clear marked religion like do they have like they themselves are now like worshippers of chaos do Mm -hmm. they because I'm thinking of like the very traditional like ultramarine ultramarines going out in search of heretics like quote unquote heretics for the for the legion under Lorgar, what do they then consider to be a heretic? Anybody that just isn't following their church specifically, or yeah, I mean they will they will conquer worlds of the Imperium. Uh, they will attempt to. I mean that's the thing. They will always start by trying to convert, and it's a okay. lot easier. Than, and it's pretty easy because everybody, a lot of people's lives in the Imperium suck. So they'll convert a large, they'll co- try to convert a planet, you know, they'll just go through various means stealthily, you know, through voices, whatever, psychically, or just by coming in being like, we can free you from this mortal coil. And then sometimes, you know what, they'll just come in and they just come onto this planet and they just start in- enslaving people because inevitably the best work you can get out of general people, especially is just by just capturing them and just using them as just enslaving them to build all your stuff that you need to do, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then probably sacrificing them in the end to summon a big demon or something like that. 
so yeah, they they kind of just do what they wish, right? They they're in a way chaotic, but in the sense of but still holding to that that this is the correct religious way to go. Is there anyone else in terms of like the other chaos legions that is actively trying to like stop them? Not actively. It's just a big thing honestly is like a lot of the legions just kind of don't if they disagree with each other, they just kind of denote that, but mm-hmm. then they just kind of leave each other alone for the most part. Um, the only kind of connecting tissue for most of the Chaos Legions and Warbands is the Black Legion. Um, but other than that, honestly, yeah, they don't often interact all too much anymore. They just kind of do their own thing. Uh, there's plenty of infighting, though, to be fair. Um, mm-hmm. If they feel like, you know, say if like the Iron Warriors feel like they want this planet for their needs, but the word bearers want to take it. They'll fucking fight them for it. You know, they'll, they'll shoot them down for it. You know, there's, there's no, there's no qualms on that aspect. Okay. They, if they need to do it, they'll do it. They're, they're very, they're all very independent in many ways, but they don't actively try to stop each other. Yeah. But speaking of things that get pretty chaotic, uh, let's talk about the alpha legion. You may notice there are two images. Of, there's a there's there's two people in this image, uh, and this would be Alpharius and Omegon. Think about the Alpha Legion. They're the like deceptive legion. They are, you know, about you know espionage, uh, using guerrilla tactics, and you know my like kind of seeping into the mindset of a of a civilization. However, the Primarch, Alpharius, was kind of split in half upon his, upon his, uh, I don't know if it was his birth or his warp eating, but secretly, Alpharius was discovered first, um, and he was kept in secret on the planet of Terra. This was part of the story that I gave you at the beginning of the last episode, where yeah, I yeah. talked about kind of the nature of the Emperor. So they're not twins. But they are still kind of they are still in a way one soul but split into two bodies so in a way twins but obviously just not technically the big thing that Alpharius had was that when he was building his legion he essentially had many of them surgically transfixed or when they would become space marines to look exactly like himself and Omegon by result mm-hmm. um, and then they would all claim to themselves to be Alpharius and this is where the mind fuckiness comes in <laughs> So the thing about the Alpha Legion is you never truly know what they're doing. You don't really know what their goals are at any given point, right? Um, many of them turn traitor because what, ha- and then many of them, there are a su- there's a sect that potentially still is like secretly loyal, right? Um, a good a good thing about a good note about this is um, that when the Horse Heresy ended, they didn't go into the eye of terror like uh, all the other traitor legions they stayed in real space the whole time oh, okay so while a number of them maybe did fall to chaos and, and there are sorcerers and all that of the alpha legion they started to kind of shift over ten thousand years they kind of s- diversified a bit and so going into today you have a number of alpha legionnaires who no longer look at all like alpharius <laughs> Um, and are trying to do their own thing and want to be- stay betrayed to the Imperium. You have another sect that hides themselves, but are inevitably still loyal to the, the Emperor. And you have another sect that are still the Alpharius, the I am Alpharius Alpha Legionnaires. Yeah. Uh, they get pinned as a lot of the enemies in a lot of books. But a lot of the Imperium, but a lot of people like to actually believe uh, the theory is that like they will go into places that they want the Imperium to see them so that it draws them into something that needs to be dealt with. Right. Like if they hear that the Alpha Legion is there, they'll come deal with it instead of letting it fester before it becomes too late. Right. Right. So, like, that's the interesting kind of thing about them. They take the Hydra as their symbol to a very great extent. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so that's the thing with the Primarchs, too. It's like 
you know, we believe that Alpharius was killed on Pluto and that Omegon just kind of took control, but then we don't fully know what happened to Omegon because he supposedly died on a planet, but that could have just been any of the Marines pretending to be any of them. Yeah, we don't know 100% for sure. Like, it's just like, we don't really fully know the answer here. Mm -hmm. The Alpha Legion is very unsure of what allegiance it's going to hold, but for now, they're, you know, they are... Um, they are a mystery, and that's what makes them kind of interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that is the remaining Legion. That was the 20th Legion. 20th. Okay. And that is all of them in total. There's still those two others that we, like, don't know about they or don't talk about. erased from history. Erased. They yeah. don't exist. They never existed. We just don't like the numbers 2 and 11, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so what are you what are your thoughts on the uh on csm here i'm just interested in the whole concept of like the again it's like i was asking about you know the the black legion and the idea of like everybody sort of even amongst all these legions that are you know kind of doing their own thing in a sense they still because of what the black legion represents and because of it being originally horace's thing that they all still feel this, like, they'll, they'll still, like, call upon them or, or work with them. Because um, I would just, I would very much expect, like, with these legions, just a very much, like, every man for himself mentality of, like, th- these legions would never work together. They, they can't possibly because they're so deeply entrenched in their own goals and what they're doing. Um, yeah, but, I mean, a lot of the legions kind of, like, uh, the Emperor's Children especially, like, became very mercenary-like. Yeah. The only thing that sucks about CSM from a tabletop model perspective is having to paint them. <laughs> there's a lot of trim. Oh, just in the in the armor design, there, there's a lot yeah, additional I mean, details that you have to kind of factor in. Yeah, yeah I can I mean, kind of like, see that compared I mean, to like an ultramarine, you know. Yeah, like especially Thousand Suns, like they're the they're the absolute worst. There's so much gold trim. Yeah. Honestly, if I had to pick an army to play as on the board between CSM or Space Marines themselves, I would probably pick CSM because I love the idea of playing the Iron Warriors. Mm-hmm. But I do love plenty of normal Space Marine Legions too. But do you have any thoughts about any ones that you like the most now that we've gone through all 20 or 18, I should say? I actually, it's interesting. I expected to be more uh, enraptured with the Chaos Space Marines. I'm finding that the the ones that have continued to remain loyal are a little more intriguing to me. Um, I don't know if that's just like a design perspective or if it's just it's interesting to me to go through this the thousands of years of history here and to still be loyal to just the Emperor. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really, I, I like that. I like the idea of like, um, and I, I think honestly, you know what it is? I think the dark angels are really interesting for that because it's, it's a, it's a legion that is loyal to the Imperium and is trying very hard to continue to be loyal to the Imperium. But then they've got this second dairy, with the with the fallen you know they've got this whole sub sub legion that is obviously like this it's like a stain on their reputation that they're trying to cover up and not expose lest they sort of lose their status as uh seen as being like very loyal i think that's a lot more interesting personally than just one of these legions that is like fully dedicated to chaos or is like fully against the imperium the dark angels are very interesting they have i mean that the fallen aspect gives them a lot of intrigue you know they the downs like the thing that i always looked at them as a downside is i wasn't a crazy about their like kind of scorched earth like mentality in some scenarios yeah sure this is a yeah i mean the, the space marines are a big part of lore um and we are going to be sticking into the Imperium on the next episode. Well, we're going to go back to the Imperium. Technically, we went out of it now. I'm disappointed in the lack of um, 
animal centric legions that the the Chaos Space <laughs> Marines seem to have compared to the Imperium. Yeah, that is the that's that's that is a downside part. Uh, they definitely are lacking in that realm. You've got the Hydra. It just, it's the yeah, sign the, of the, the Alpha Hydra's Legion. cool. Don't get me wrong. And, the, the Alpha Legion's but that's cool. It. But... There's really nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> All the animal legions are in the are loyal, remain loyal. <laughs> all the all the animorphs are hanging out over on that side. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, listening, watching. Uh, make sure you tune in for the next episode where we will talk about the Imperial Guard, Woo. and then after that, we'll probably do a Xenos faction. But I don't know which one yet. I'll have to think about that when we choose that one. But otherwise, until then, see you later. All right. Take care, guys.